Of course, he was upset about that, and I wanted him to be because I wanted him to feel what I had felt with a guy that I'd gone to school with. And one of the things that I had done is said, cut that relationship off. I don't feel guilt in the sense that if I had done something differently, that it could have been prevented. I don't feel that type of guilt. I, sometimes I feel that. Unique in that historical sense, in other ways, the Francis Newton case was painfully unexceptional, for there was no incontrovertible evidence against Newton, and the paltry evidence that does exist had been completely compromised. Moreover, her story is one more in the long line of Texas Roe cases in which the prosecutions were sloppy or dishonest, the defenses incompetent or negligent, and the constitutional guarantee of a fair trial was honored only in name. The Crime in the months before the slayings, Francis and Adrian Newton were having marital problems. They were each involved in extramarital relationships. Of course, he was upset about that, and I wanted him to be because I wanted him to feel what I had felt with a guy that I'd gone to school with. And one of the things that I had done is said, cut that relationship off. Adrian hadn't been faithful in a marriage uh, for several, several times, and. Um, I had, unfortunately, I had started a relationship and, and he said that he would quit doing, you know, quit, you know, and when I say that I wanted to fix it, that's what, so one of the things that I was going to fix is I wasn't going to do that anymore. On my part, after so many times, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to do this and let him see how it feels, you know, and I did. and. That wasn't a good thing on my part. Running around, he would quit doing drugs and he would quit doing illegal activity. And Adrian was using drugs. In an August 30 Gatesville prison interview, Newton told me that in addition to smoking marijuana, Adrian had developed a cocaine habit. She said, he had told me he was using cocaine, but I'd never seen that, but I saw the effects of it. He was home later, he was irritable, less responsible. But she and Adrian had been together since she was a girl, and she was determined to work things out. That was on her mind on the afternoon of April 7, 1987, when she and Adrian sat down and talked. Adrian insisted that he wasn't using any more, so when they were done talking and Adrian went into the living room to watch TV, quietly she opened the cabinet where he kept his stash. That's where she found a gun. I'm trying to confirm that he, he's telling me the truth about the drugs. And so I looked in the cabinet where he normally kept drugs. There was this gun there. You know, I, I had heard Adrian and his brother talking earlier that day. And Adrian had told me he had was quit using drugs. And so I looked in the cabinet, and I'm just trying. And they had mentioned something about some trouble. And it was unfamiliar to me. Newton said she immediately recalled a conversation she'd heard earlier that day between Adrian and his brother, Sterling, who'd been saying with the family. I couldn't hear real close, but it sounded like they'd been in some trouble, she said. I thought I'd better take the gun out of there because I didn't want it to be in the house. I didn't want him to get into any trouble. She removed the gun, placed it in a duffel bag, and took it with her when she left the apartment around 6 p.m. to run some errands, she says. Newton says it was the last time she saw her family alive. At 7 p.m. after a couple of errands, Newton arrived at her cousin Sandra Nelm's house, where the two chatted and decided to return to Newton's apartment. As Newton backed out of the drive, she saw the duffel on the back seat and realized she needed to hide it. With Nelms watching, Newton retrieved the bag and walked next door into a burned and abandoned house owned by her parents, and there she left the bag. The women arrived at the apartment around 8 p.m. and didn't immediately realize that anything was wrong. Newton thought Adrian was napping until she saw the blood. As Francis walked around the couch and saw his upper torso, she immediately screamed and bolted to the children's bedroom. Francis began to frantically scream uncontrollably. Newton says she was shocked and dazed, but gave police as much information as possible, including the fact that she'd just removed a gun from the house. She told police about Adrian's drug habit and that he owed some money to a dealer, which Adrian's brother Terence corroborated telling police he knew where the dealer lived. Police never pursued the lead. A bullet remained lodged in Adrian's head, meaning that the blood and brain matter would have been blown back onto the gun and shooter, confirmed by a trail of blood found in the hallway. Police found no trace of gunshot residue on Newton's hands, 
nor on the long sleeves of the sweater she was wearing. They collected the clothing she'd worn that day. There was no blood nor any trace of blood on any of the items. I don't feel guilt in the sense that if I had done something differently that it could have been prevented. I don't feel that type of guilt. I, sometimes I feel that I could have said something earlier about, about the things that Adrian was doing and maybe earlier it could have been prevented or maybe not even agreed with it at first. I asked myself what could I have done differently. Problems with the trial. As in many Texas capital cases, a large part of the problem with Newton's appeals is that her court-appointed trial attorney, Ron Mock, never actually investigated her case. If he had, perhaps he would have followed up on the drug dealer lead or Freeze's reported comments about a second gun. Newton and her parents implored the trial judge to allow her to change attorneys, and Mock admitted to the judge that he hadn't talked to any prosecution witnesses, nor had he subpoenaed any defense witness. The judge granted the motion to remove Mock, but he declined a continuance leaving Newton little choice but to go on trial with Mock. It is interesting to know Mock has since been brought before the state bar's disciplinary board at least five times on various charges of professional misconduct, for which he has been fined and sometimes suspended. He is currently suspended from practicing law until late 2007. As Harris County prosecutors tell the story, Newton was a cold-blooded slayer who slaughtered her husband and two young children inside the family's apartment outside Houston on April 7, 1987, by shooting each of them in order to collect life insurance. Newton had the opportunity, they argued, during her 1988 trial and a motive, a troubled relationship with her husband, Adrian, and the promise of $100,000 in insurance money from policies she'd recently taken out on his life and on the life of their 21-month-old daughter, Farah. And she had the means, they say, a 25 caliber Raven Arms pistol she had allegedly stolen from a boyfriend's house. To the state, it is a simple open and shut case, which requires no further review. Her case has been reviewed by every possible court, Harris County Assistant District Attorney Roe Wilson told the Los Angeles Times in November. She exterminated her two children and her husband. There is very, very strong evidence of that. Yet despite Wilson's insistence, Newton's case isn't simple at all, and such evidence as there is, is far from strong. The state's theory is simple, and it is superficially compelling. Attorney David Dow, head of the Texas Innocence Network at the University of Houston Law Center, argued in Newton's clemency petition. As we will see, however, appearances can be misleading. From the beginning, Frances Newton maintained her innocence. She has also offered a plausible alternative theory of the crime, a theory that neither police, prosecutors, nor Newton's own trial attorney the infamous and suspended Ronald Mock ever investigated. Newton and her defenders contend that Adrian, Farah, and seven-year-old Alton were likely destroyed by someone connected to a drug dealer to whom Adrian owed $1,500. The alternative theory has much to say for it. Among other things, it explains the lack of physical evidence connecting Newton to the slayings. Lingering questions about the physical evidence against Newton prompted the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles to recommend and Governor Rick Perry to grant a 120-day reprieve for Newton on December 1, 2004, the day she was last scheduled for her punishment. Although Perry said he saw no evidence of innocence, legally an oxymoron, he granted the four-month stay to allow for retesting of evidence contested by Newton's defense, including nitrite residue on the hem of her skirt and gun ballistics evidence. But testing on the skirt proved impossible because the 1987 tests had destroyed the nitrite particles and Harris County court officials had stored the skirt by sealing it inside a bag together with items of the victim's bloody clothing, thereby rendering it worthless as evidence. The second round of ballistics testing, on the other hand, supposedly confirmed a match between the gun prosecutors say Newton used and the bullets that destroyed her family. However, that match may be fundamentally undermined because there is no certain connection between the gun and Newton. According to Dow, it appears that police actually recovered at least two and perhaps three 25 caliber Raven Arms pistols during their investigation of the slayings, conflicting evidence to Newton's defense. Dow argues that it is virtually impossible to know whether prosecutors have been truthful in claiming that the gun that Newton admits to hiding on April 7, 1987 was the slaying weapon. Dow asked the following questions in a supplemental petition filed with the BPP on August 25. 
How many records have been withheld from Newton's attorneys throughout this case? How many firearms were recovered and investigated in this case, and who owned them? However, in the end, the fact that a forensics expert for the state established that nitrites were present on the skirt Newton wore on the day of the shootings played against her. In the expert's opinion, the nitrites came from gunpowder residue and were consistent with someone shooting a pistol in the lower front area of the skirt. Less than a month prior to the slayings, Newton purchased a $50,000 life insurance policy for herself, another for her husband, and a third for her daughter. Newton, the primary beneficiary of the latter two policies, made claims on the policies following the slayings. She was sentenced to her end. Final Punishment The punishment was carried out as scheduled on September 14, 2005 by lethal injection. Newton struggled and thrashed, knocking out one of the nurses. Frances Newton was the third woman punished with capital punishment in Texas since the resumption of capital punishment in the state in 1982. The first and second were Carla Faye Tucker and Betty Lou Beats, respectively. Like Beats before her, Newton made no final statement and did not have a last meal request. Over 30 protesters from the Texas Penalty Abolition Movement, the National Black United Front, and the New Black Panther Party had gathered outside the prison. In addition, about 75 people protested the punishment outside the governor's mansion in Austin. According to the results of a Public Information Act request submitted by Texas Moratorium Network to the office of Governor Rick Perry, 12,201 people contacted the governor asking him to stop Newton's punishment, and 10 people contacted him in support of her punishment. During the investigation of Francis Newton, the forensic crime lab in the Houston Police Department was also experiencing intense criticism for the handling of evidence. Michael R. Bromwich, a former U.S. Justice Department official, said the Houston Police Department and city officials failed to provide the crime lab with adequate resources to meet growing demands for at least 15 years before the exposure of problems in its DNA division. That's all for today's video. We'll see you next time.